Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I invite you to join us as we sing. 
invite those of you that are members back for a brief uh, business meeting to discuss some repairs that we are proposing that need to be done to the building. We will announce that at the end, have a short break, and then return for that meeting. I just wanted to let you know that. At this time, we are going to open up in a word of prayer, so if you would, please bow with me. Father God, thank you that we can come together in this place. Thank you that we can bow in your presence. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. And even now, we come directly to the throne of God through him, through his blood offered on our behalf, through the forgiveness of sins that he has provided for each one that trusts in him. Thank you that as we speak with you, we know you are sovereign, in control. We know that you have limitless power. You are in all places. And you uh, are pleased to hear from your people. Lord, I do pray today in this season, and I think about many who are in a season of graduation. Uh, We know this happens at various stages of life, from very young at kindergarten, eighth grade, high school, college. And we know that many of us are touched by the lives of people who are graduating in this season. And it marks the end and the completion of one season of life and then the beginning of the next. And so for those that are graduating, those that are moving through this season, we're thankful for them and those that are part of our church family here. We pray that you would specifically speak to their hearts, guide them in next steps, show them your way, and it can often be overwhelming to look to the future and discern your will, but I pray that that would be known, and I pray as they move through these seasons that they would remember you that you would give them the power to reflect you well in the places that you take them. Lord, we certainly know that there are those that are struggling with health issues, and that gets heavy on our heart, and you've asked us to pray for them. And I I lift up a name this morning that I know him, and he was a Bible school teacher of mine, and he is in a serious health condition. And so I pray for the family of Rob Burns, and I pray, Lord, that you would... um, help in his situation for his wife, for his children, for his grandchildren, um, Lord, and that you would be pleased to raise him up and bring healing to his body. I pray for Fran, Lord. I pray for Linda. I pray for Cheryl. And I pray, Lord, as they've gotten a diagnosis for Fran and there's cancer, I pray, Lord, that you would just overwhelm them with your peace, with your presence, with the knowledge that you are good and gracious and kind. And we're going to speak about that this morning. Lord, and I pray that they would turn to you in this time and see your good hand even in these days. Pray for Dan and Cheryl as they're away and they're traveling. Lord, I pray for a time of rest, and we know there's a time of ministry and there was a wedding and investment there, but I pray, Lord, that you would provide safety and even a time of rejuvenation for them. I pray for our services today, for what's happening in the levels below us with young people, Lord, that you would guide them and speak to their hearts what happens here in this room, Lord, that your word and the words that we sing would help us to honor you, worship you, and praise you in spirit and in truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship. Mm -hmm. 
this morning, if you have a Bible with you, uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Joel. So I'll give you a little jump start here <laughs> to try to find that. That's in the later part of the Old Testament. Um, those of us that are well-versed and those of us that are new will still be struggling to find it. So Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, if you're finding any of those names, you're getting close. <laughs> Just three chapters. Um, we're going to look at this together. While you're turning, let's uh, bow and let's say a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you that we have it in the way that we do, bound here before us, written in all manner of ways, uh, and for the ages of church fathers and scholars and people throughout history that have unfolded it to us in ways that we need so that our spirits can be refreshed in you and understand your truth. And I pray that you will help us and guide us in this time as we look at Joel, part of your canon, part of your scripture, and yet something that we maybe don't consider all that often. And so I pray that you'll help us and guide us and apply this in ways that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. The prophet Joel. So it's a challenge here, really, to help you understand much about the details and background uh, of Joel. Um, with many of the prophets, we start out the book and we get these introductory statements that help us understand what's going on. They identify who's speaking, who they are, who their family is, who they're talking to, and the times in which they lived, for instance. Um, we see this in Isaiah 1.1. It says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So, a little mysterious maybe to look at, but nonetheless, it places things quite well for us. We know who Isaiah is, we know who his dad is, where, who he's speaking to, and we also know the kings that he lived during, so we can go back in the historical books in the Old Testament, and we can say, this is the times, these are the things that were happening when Isaiah spoke, and it helps us make sense of what he said. Joel gives us a lot less. You'll notice in Joel 1.1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. So basically, we get to know who his dad is, and that's about it. So you can imagine throughout history, this book, short book, scholars, people who study the Bible have drawn upon clues from within the book. They read it, and they try to place it, and they try to figure it out and answer the questions about who he was and what he said and what time he lived. And you are right to imagine that scholars draw different conclusions. <laughs> they come up with different ideas about who Joel was and when he lived and what he was saying. But many of the prophets, will just I'll give you this because this is kind of what shaped my thinking. Many of the prophets are kind of placed around one big event in the history of Israel, and that's known as the exile. So at one point in the history of Israel, they were conquered by foreign nations, taken captive, removed from the land, and then they returned. And that big event, of course, marked them. To be conquered, to, be, to have your nation destroyed, to be taken away as captives, of course, is part of their history. And so a lot of the prophets are placed. Were they before the exile? Some of them, were they around the time of this conquering? And some of them, were they after the exile? And so that's kind of the debate. Where was Joel? I'm going to say I would lean from what I read into thinking that Joel is after the exile and probably after they returned. You can read all kinds of things that will have good arguments on all sides, um, but that's just sort of where I landed. For our purposes today, however, I don't think that the conclusions that we're going to draw and the way that we're going to apply this, it really matters much for our purposes today. Joel starts out in chapter 1 talking about what was happening in the time in which he lived, regardless of when that was. And so in chapter 1, Joel describes a crisis that was precipitated by a locust infestation. That's what we're going to be talking about, locusts, insects, and then a subsequent drought. Now, some commentators, when you read them, will say the locusts are symbols. They weren't actual insects. They were symbols of armies. Again, as we read it, and you're going to read some of it with me, I would say I don't see that because often when an army comes, we read things about death, destruction, plunder, captivity, 
And those aren't the kinds of things that we read. Instead, we read a lot about how it impacted their crops, the vegetation, and the destruction to the land. So that's the conclusion and the way that I'm going to lean, that these are actual insects that infested the area of, in the place where Joel lived. There is a reference in verse 6, you will see, about a nation. And so that nation in verse 6 is described as doing damage, you'll read it there, with its teeth. And so um, when I think about invading armies, I don't generally think of their primary weapon as being their teeth. I think that is still describing a group of locusts, bugs, that did destruction in that way. So you see it there. A nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are described in the destruction that it brings. And these natural events really bring an unparalleled catastrophe to Joel's land, uh, something that they haven't seen even in recent history. So verse 2 Look what it says there. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? He's asking a rhetorical question. Has anything like this ever happened before? And really the answer we're supposed to get is, no, we haven't seen anything like this. I'm sure there are things that I could mention that have marked our own nation and our own lives. I could go back through ages, and depending on how long you've lived, if I mention certain events and you lived through them, you would remember them because they mark us, because they're so tragic, they're so catastrophic, that they mark our national life. And this was one of those things for the people of Israel. When we think about insects, we don't necessarily consider all the damage that could be done, but let's look at how Joel describes what happens here. Here's Joel 1.4. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. And probably this is a reference to the development of locusts. Those of you that like bugs will be into this. Locusts start out as larvae that walk across the earth. Then they develop um, wings and then those wings are released, and then they fly. And so they, they start walking, then they hop, then finally they fly, and their life cycle is pretty short. They lay eggs and multiply themselves, and then uh, they die. And so it's talking about the way that the different development of the locust here has devastated the land. And then in verse 20, we read this. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up, and the, fower, the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness." This seems to be a reference to maybe a subsequent drought. So, I mean, things go from bad to worse, the infestation of locusts. So, I did some reading about this just to try to get some perspective. What in the world are we talking about? Locusts have invaded the land. And the consequence of this for a people who depends on their crops is inestimable, frankly. I read modern accounts from the 1700s up through even as late as 2020, and here are a few of the journal entries that I read, 1724. In the middle of April, their numbers were so vastly increased that in the heat of the day, they formed themselves into large bodies, appeared like succession of clouds, and darkened the sun. 1863, what strikes everyone as they approach is the strange rustling of millions on millions of crisp wings. They laid their eggs in the ground, and though thousands were destroyed, many yet remained, and the young wingless larvae crawled over the ground, creating far greater havoc than their winged parents. This one is undated, but it says their number was astounding. The whole face of the mountain was black with them. On they came like a disciplined army. We dug trenches and kindled fires and beat and burnt to death heaps upon heaps, but the effort was utterly useless. They charged up the mountainside and they climbed over rocks, walls, ditches, and hedges. Those behind coming up and passing over the masses already killed, and for days they continued to pass on towards the east until finally only a few stragglers of the mighty hosts were left behind. Whilst on the march, they consumed every green thing with eagerness and expedition. And as recently as 2020, I 
did a little bit of research as uh, some folks from Harvard went to East Africa, and they talked about locust infestation and how they're trying to stave off the destruction of these insects. They estimate that some of the swarms number from tens to hundreds of millions of insects at a time. They even spoke of them covering as many as 50 square miles. It is inestimable what we're talking about here when these insects come. On its own, pretty small, not too much to worry about. When they gather together and multiply by the millions, and each one eats its weight in vegetation every day, they will literally strip the land, and they are unstoppable even amidst the greatest of human efforts. Even in 2020, what they use for chemicals to try to stop them so that they can sustain their livestock will often so impact the earth that it will kill off the livestock anyway. I mean, we're not really getting anywhere in being able to stop these insects. How does Joel describe its impact in his day? Verse 7, it has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It's stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Verse 10, the fields are destroyed, the ground mourns, because the grain is destroyed, the wine dries up, the oil languishes. And further sadness for the people of Israel is mentioned in verse 9. One nine. it says this, The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. So now they're talking about how it impacts worship because now we have no offerings of grain and food and agriculture to offer. Crops are decimated. Food supplies are gone. Animals are dying for lack, and there are no resources to offer to God in worship. Sustenance, celebration, joy, and worship come to an abrupt halt. And as Joel surveys the destruction and devastation, it calls one thing to mind for him, and that is judgment. God's hand is behind all of this. And I would say that the best thing to stave off locusts that I read about is a strong wind, and we know who's in control of the wind. We read it throughout Scripture. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he let out the south wind. And speaking of Jesus himself in Mark 4, 41, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So Joel sees here a scourge that mankind really has no power to impact, and the only possible remedy is to cry out to God for deliverance. And that's exactly what Joel calls the people to do. We're not going to hit every verse, but we're going to keep trucking through. And verse 13 and 14, look what Joel calls the people to do. Put on sackcloth and lament. O priests, wail. O ministers of the altar, Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. And then notice what he calls for. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. This is devastation, catastrophic, and he's describing it here. But before things get better, they even get worse. And so Joel is a guy watching an actual event like this that I've just tried to describe for you. And while he's witnessing it, God's Spirit uses what he's watching happening in real time to foreshadow something else that's coming. And so while Joel watches locusts come in rank after rank after rank, unstoppable, Joel sees another day coming of God's judgment, which is referenced throughout the book called the Day of the Lord. When God will come with another army, but not insects, actually his army. And so Joel 2.1, look what it says. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord, notice the tense here, is coming. It is near. It has not yet arrived. What they've experienced is not yet this future day of the Lord that is coming. Well, what judgment coming? And it is actually, in this case, the Lord's army. Skip down to verse 11 of chapter 2, and look what it says. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great, so it's the Lord's army. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? 
And so it kind of goes from bad to worse. This is not the message that you want to hear when your land has been devastated. There's another day of the Lord coming. No, we can't endure it. And that's exactly what Joel says. But thankfully, there is a message of real deep hope for these people. So chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 things turn. Verse 12, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and notice the language here, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster." I really love this section of Scripture here. This is very powerful in my mind. Because of the gracious and merciful nature of God, Joel reminds the people that even now, when things seem impossible, destitute, if they will cry out to Him, He may indeed relent of the disaster that He has allowed. However, notice the language. It's not just the outward symbols. It's not just tearing the clothes, which was often a sign of their heartache. It's that they would rend their hearts. God wants their hearts to turn to Him. He wants a relationship with them. He wants them to open themselves up to Him and receive from Him. And these verses are further powerful to me because what Joel is doing here is helping us to see the continuity of the story of Scripture. This idea that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger is a quote from Exodus 34 when Moses was receiving from God the Ten Commandments. And it is God himself who describes himself in this way to Moses. And he says, I am gracious. I am merciful. I am slow to anger. And so Joel reaches back through the centuries to God's word. And so this isn't Joel saying, I think God will be kind to us if we do the right thing. This is him reaching back to scriptural truth, pulling it forward and applying it to the people who have been devastated and saying, we know this is who our God is. And if we turn to him, even now he may relent because we can know he's unchanging throughout the ages. He will be gracious. He will be kind. He is slow to anger. His steadfast love will remain. And so he ties together scripture. They think back to their own release from bondage in Egypt at the time of Moses, and he brings it forward to a time of great devastation and says, don't forget the nature of God even now. In verses 17 and 18, we actually see the people beginning to turn. It's not fully described for us, so that's interesting, but we're going to look at it. Verse 17 here is Joel's call to the priests, the spiritual leaders of the people, what do you need to do? Notice what he says. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And so Joel says, priests, get together, say a prayer, ask God to rescue his name and his people. And it seems that Joel actually does this, although we do not read about it. What we next read in verse 18 is the Lord himself addressing his people, the beginning of it, and notice what it says. It says, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. It seems they actually did this. The priests got together, the people got together, they held the solemn assembly, they repented, they turned, they cried out. And then the Lord answered them in verse 19. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. But before they got there, they had to respond to God. They had to turn to him. They had to rend their hearts. They had to repent. They had to, the priests had to lead prayers for the people. I can't imagine how it must have been for them in the middle of their crisis to try to hang on to these words of hope, that God is good, God loves us, God is gracious. And not only does God promise to restore what had been lost, He goes even further. And so I, I think this is a great parallel. For me, it struck me that when Joel saw the locusts and the devastation, it foreshadowed an even worse judgment 
He said, this isn't it. There's another day of the Lord coming. When God said he would restore, he said, I will bring you back to what you lost. You read about it in 225. I'll restore the years that the locusts have taken. But the promise goes further. There's an even greater glory. Bad judgment, bad devastation, an even worse day coming. Restoration, back to what was, but even a greater glory coming. I love what God does there in this, in this story of restoration. And he tells the people to be glad, to look forward to it. And he uses the picture of rain, which I want us to hold on to here, Joel 2, 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. You can imagine that for a land that's been decimated agriculturally, that's probably experiencing a drought, rain is very, very good news. This is exactly what we need for the parched earth. And he says, I'm going to restore the vitality of the earth. But before that happened, the people had to turn their hearts. So their hearts were turned, their fellowship was restored, and then God blessed the earth. It's an outward visible symbol of what had already happened within. They had already turned in repentance, and now the earth too would be replenished. God would send pouring rain on the parched land to restore it. He uses that refreshing rain in a decimated land to later speak about how he refreshes our hearts. And this is why we are in Joel this morning. Joel 2, 28 and 29. Notice what it says, and these words maybe will be familiar to you. Joel now says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. He's going to pour out rain on the land to deal with the parched earth. And Joel says, afterward, another day is coming even greater than the restoration of the earth. I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit on all flesh. And so think about the people living in that moment, thinking how desperately they need a pouring rain, a dousing rain for days to replenish the earth. And he takes the same language and says, someday you will experience the pouring out of God's Spirit on all people. Now, this is unique because in Joel's day, what I believe and understand in Scripture is that the Holy Spirit was active and working, but came to visit people for a time. And so Joel undoubtedly had the Holy Spirit helping him to pen these words and finish the job, but the promise was not the Holy Spirit will stay with you permanently in your life, but that I'll visit you and empower you to do the task, and then maybe the Spirit will visit others. What Joel here is saying, a day is coming when I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. I won't just be visiting individuals. Everyone who names the name of Christ as Savior will receive as if a pouring rain, the Holy Spirit within their own spirit. God himself, by his spirit, will come to permanently indwell and live with them. And so Joel takes what's happening in the moment, and he says, look forward to another day coming. I think last week when Dan taught on Pentecost and the Feast of Pentecost, he referenced that in a couple of weeks here, we are going to start into the book of Acts. And so we're kind of prepping for some of that. And so right now, if you would, turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 2. You're going to see how these words resonate in real time in the New Testament. Joel's words used once again, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to just start in verse 12 and read a couple of verses and then give some context here. Acts chapter 2, 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. So this is the day of Pentecost. This is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And when that happened, you might remember there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. There appeared tongues of fire on their heads. 
and they spoke, but they were understood by people from all over the region in different languages. And the people watching it were going, what in the world are we witnessing? What is happening right here? And so you read it. Some of them said, what does this mean? And others tried to use their own insight and said, I know what's going on. These people are drunk. (laughs) And so that's what's going on here. This is insanity. And Peter, this is, this is awesome. Peter is standing there in the moment. I mean, we're talking centuries later from Joel. He watches what's happening, and notice what happens in verse 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. They haven't had time yet. (laughs) is what he's saying. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Here it is. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I'm going to keep reading, and these words are also in Joel. And I will show the wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The continuity here of Scripture for me is one of the things that I drew from this, that Joel reached back to the days of Moses and brought Scripture forward to apply to the people in his day and made a prophecy about a coming day, and Peter stood up and was watching what was going on, and he said, I know what's happening. Hundreds of years ago, Joel told us this was coming, and he pulls Scripture from Joel, and he pulls it forward to their day at the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit comes on all believers. And I am very challenged in a couple of things that I'm going to draw here as we kind of bring this to a close. By the way that God used both Joel and Peter to confidently assert their knowledge of Scripture and apply it to their current situation. When Joel saw the locusts, he was able to foresee through the Holy Spirit a coming judgment far worse. God's Spirit visiting him showed him something coming. He also was able to reach back to the days of Moses and pull forward a description of the nature of God and said, don't lose hope. I know it's bad, but don't forget the nature of God is unchanging. And we can bank on it because we've seen it for generation after generation after generation. And no matter how bad it is right now, don't forget he will still relent if we turn to him. And then Peter confidently stands up when the people are like, what in the world is happening? And make their own natural interpretation of what they think is going on. Peter makes a supernatural interpretation. He leans into the spirit and the truth of God's word, and he says, this is what you are witnessing because Joel told us it would happen. To be clear on this, in case I misconstrued it, I believe that scripture is written and complete Here are the 66 books of the canon, and I don't think we're adding to them, nor should we. But I am suggesting that if we are students of Scripture, we can, as the Bible tells us, rightly divide the truth that we have been given in the Bible and bring it to bear in right ways to the situations and events of our day with the confidence given by the Holy Spirit that lives within us. I think we need this clarity today. I think I need this clarity today. I think it's right for us as individuals and as a church to ask the Holy Spirit of God to apply his word appropriately to the days and times in which we live. To see situations, catastrophes, inexplicable occurrences, and discern what is God doing? What is God saying? What does God intend? And how should we respond? In the cases of both Joel and Peter, this was not simply their own insight or wisdom or good thinking. God, by his word and through the power of his spirit, used them to convey God's message to his people. And so I would say, as a challenge to our church, let us be a people that know our Bibles and know our God. To me, it is so needful in our time.
And lastly, I'll end here with maybe an even more personal connection for all of us. The connection of the language of pouring rain and its effects on agriculture connected to the Holy Spirit is not unique to Joel. We read about these kinds of lang- this kind of language being used about the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture, um, being connected to a vine, experiencing the fruitfulness of the Spirit. And so, this is not an accident, and I think we can lean into this, and I'll just ask you a question. Is your own spirit parched? Do you feel dried up? And you might say, well, how would I know, and what does that look like? I can speak about this personally. (laughs) It might look like no joy, but rather a spirit of complaint. It might look like a lack of fruitfulness. Maybe you feel more stagnant or shriveling. It might look like a lack of abundance. You feel stingy and hoarding. (laughs) And these are things, when you take a self-assessment, that you say, I don't think the fruit of the Spirit is abundant and flowing in my heart. And if you find that you are in that place, as I say those things, and as we all think about our own hearts, what are we to do? How can we be rejuvenated, reinvigorated, refreshed in our spirits with the fullness of the Spirit of God? I think the same instruction that God gave to His people through Joel in Joel's day is still applicable today. Rend your hearts. Turn to God. It may be that there is a specific sin in your life that you need to repent of. It may be that you cannot put your finger on it. But if you open your heart, tear your heart, and ask God to visit you, He will be gracious. He will be merciful. His steadfast love will endure. And He can bring rejuvenation, reinvigoration, and health to your spirit by his spirit in you, so that you are marked by joy, by fruitfulness, by abundance, by generosity. I believe that since the day of Pentecost, what we've just read here in Acts 2, God's spirit is received into the life of everyone that trusts in the name of Christ as Savior. But Scripture says we can quench the spirit. It's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. When we allow the Spirit to control our lives, I believe He can and will work through us to bring refreshing to our spiritually decimated and dry hearts at times, just like an abundant rain falling on a parched earth. And I believe when that happens that the life of God's Spirit in us will not only refresh our own hearts, but will overflow and impact the world around us. And I don't know about you, but often as I walk through the world and view the lives of people around me, sometimes from a distance and sometimes intimately, sometimes there's a dryness, and you wish that you could be the vehicle of pouring out refreshing, rejuvenating, reinvigorating rain into the landscape of the hearts and lives of people around us. We have that truth. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have all the way back to beginning, the words of Moses, the words of Joel, many others. We have the New Testament. We have the epistles. We even have future promises that have not been yet fulfilled. And I think as we lean into the Word, know the Word, are intimately related to the Spirit and rend our hearts for Him to fill us, it impacts us but it can impact the lives of the people that we walk around, that we interact with, that we brush shoulders with, and that we could indeed be the vehicle of bringing refreshing to our families, our communities. And as the Spirit moves, and He he is sovereign, we don't manipulate Him, but we can cry out to Him and we can ask Him. He could use us to be that vehicle to bring refreshing rejuvenation to a time that seems dry, to a time that seems mysterious and difficult. Would that God would do that? Would that we would pray to him that we could be the vehicle of such refreshing in our time? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Joel. We didn't uh, really get too far into a lot of the details, but a broad sweep the understanding of a people that had been decimated and were struggling and were suffering, and a man who stood up and said, God's nature is unchanging and we can trust him.
And they turned, and they repented, and you, you blessed them, and you blessed their land, and you didn't just restore to what was. You even promised a greater glory, and we live in a day and age when the Spirit has already been poured out on His people. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us to be people who do not quench the Spirit in our own lives. He certainly is present with us when we trust Christ, but we can walk through life and in ways quench His power, His fruitfulness, His abundance. Help us to be rejuvenated, reinvigorated. Help us to be filled, as Ephesians 5 tells us, with the Holy Spirit of God, that He would control our words and our actions, and that we would walk through the world like a pouring rain in a parched parched landscape. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us again.
moment. I just want to say at the close, I referenced several times that if you've trusted in the name of Jesus as your Savior, you would be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, or that language seems foreign to you, I'd be glad to speak to you about what that means, about what Scripture says, about how you can trust the Lord, His plan of salvation when He died, was buried, rose again for you and for your sin. We are going to convene a meeting of the church in just a few moments, but we're going to take a break for a few minutes. Those of you that have children downstairs, if you would retrieve them, if you want to stay for the meeting, we're going to welcome them to be here, and we will reconvene probably in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Grab an agenda, Dennis is saying at the back for the meeting uh, when you reconvene, and one per family. Thank you, Beth. We're getting it done. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Have a wonderful afternoon. God bless.